Welcome to the Global Fluency Podcast. This is a space we've created to explore the components of diversity, inclusion, and cultural competency. Cultural competency. And all of the ways in which these components present themselves in our professional and personal lives. Be it language, culture, socioeconomic class, gender, race, ability level, age, or so many other identifiers. Everything begins with a conversation. conversation. Join us in this space where we seek to empower, educate, and uplift by creating authentic conversations on issues that affect us every day in every way. We look forward to you joining us in our discussions with everyone from thought leaders, diversity and inclusion strategists, students to CEOs in the corporate, education, and nonprofit sectors. Let's discuss how we can better understand differences and leverage commonality. Let's do away with political correctness, explore ideation, build community, and create allies. Let's start an authentic conversation. This is the Global Fluency Podcast, and this is Bertine Crevacore West. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Global Fluency Podcast. My name is Bertine Crevacore West, and I'm delighted to be your host today. So today I have with me a very special guest and a dear, dear friend, Dr. Danny Lee Harris. Dr. Danny, can you say hi to our audience? Hey, everybody. We're so delighted to have you here. So I'm going to tell everybody a little bit about you. So Dr. Danny Lee Harris is the president of Truth, Inc., a nonprofit 501c3 which aims to help people to understand their uniqueness and their personal contribution to the world through their gifts and life's purpose. To do that, most people need to see the beauty in their pain and their experiences. By turning pain into passion and trials into triumph, we not only empower ourselves, but we can change the interconnected lives around us. Truth is changing lives through self-empowerment, acts of service, training, seminars, motivational retreats, life coaching, books, etiquette classes, scholarship, and various life-changing gifts. Truth has started the work by buying elderly people groceries, waiting online, donating clothes to the battered women and children, adopting families around the holidays to provide food and presents, holiday toy drives by partnering with Toys for Tots organization, and Danny has donated hundreds of hours in free training and seminars in the last 10 years, understanding that the goal and the mission of Truth are much bigger than the person with the vision. Dr. Danny Lee holds a doctorate in business administration from Argosy University, a master's of human resource management from Keller School of Management and a bachelor of science from DeVry University. An 18 year veteran of law enforcement, Dr. Danny retired from the Atlanta Police Department in 2015 to pursue collegiate teaching, which he continues to teach classes for various colleges in the Metro Atlantic area as an adjunct professor. Dr. Danny Lee is a two-time self-published author currently working on an eight-book self-help series called From Cradle to Grave. Cradle to Grave, Emotional Maturity and Knowledge is Power, What Everyone Should Know About the Police and Their Published Works that are currently available. Dr. Danny Lee is a renowned inspirational speaker, author, writer, and life coach. He resides in Metro Atlanta, Georgia, raising his toddler daughter. Dr. Danny Lee Harris, my friend, welcome to the show. Thank you. I appreciate you for having me. Now, this is a long time coming um, because as we were talking about off air, we have just, I have personally wanted to have you on the show for the longest, longest time. And so thank you for your patience with me <laughs> for, for finally getting there. That's not a problem. I believe all things is in perfect time. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, because of um, our situation that we're currently evolving through with COVID, um, we had to postpone the Global Fluency Summit, the 2021, from April until October 2020. So my thought was to have the speakers, yourself being one of them, come and share your knowledge, your insights on the podcast So we can keep the excitement going, so we can keep the knowledge going, so we can keep the education flowing. So I'm really grateful that you are here. And today we're going to be talking about the oneness in us all, right? The the topic that you were going to present and are going to present at the Global Fluency Summit. And a part of that is discussing intersex people. And so we're just going to just dive right into it. I want you to tell our audience a little bit about your professional background, things that I might not have mentioned um, in your bio, but tell us a little bit about yourself, what you're doing today. Uh, thank you again for having me on the show. Uh, today, I am building Truth. That is my 
objective. And I'm doing that through seminars and through life coaching, as well as making sure that I finish this eight book series that I've started. So that is my, my primary goals. I also do videos on YouTube, uh, which is what I've been kind of working on a lot lately uh, since we're in the house. So working on YouTube as well as just trying to use all of my platforms and social media outlets in order to reach more uh, people. Okay. And so now I want to ask you, tell us about your experiences with diversity and inclusion, because as you know, this podcast covers every aspect of diversity. And so, um, you know, we were talking about race off air. And one of the things that made me, propelled me to create this podcast was that race and ethnicity are often talked about in diversity and inclusion, but those are, and while they are important topics or characteristics thereof, they are just two characteristics of mm-hmm. the diversity, inclusion, and equity sphere, right? Yes. There's so many more things that we need to consider. There's neurodiversity, which you know is um, a very dear subject to my heart, right? Um, there's diversity of socioeconomic class. Mm-hmm. There's gender identity. Mm-hmm. There's sexual identity, mm-hmm. and which are not the same things. And I stress this whenever I'm training a diversity and inclusion course because it's not touched upon enough. There's um, age diversity, there's diversity of thought, religion, spirituality, right? Which are not the same thing as well. So I love that you're just this perfect fit for what we need to talk about on so many levels. And for those listeners um, right now, the listeners that are with us right now, I'm going to be fully transparent. Dr. Danny Lee Harris is also a very dear friend of mine since high school. And so I am blessed and privileged to have seen not only my evolution, but the evolution of Dr. Danny Lee Harris, right? And I want you to share that with our audience um, because I think it's pertinent, it's timely, it's necessary. And, and really, my goal in having us have this discussion is to talk about allyship and what that really means, right? On a day-to-day basis, not in this, you know, uh, theoretical sense, but how we can really be allies to intersex people, to intersex children in particular, right? Mm-hmm. I want to touch upon that because that is some some that is a topic I do not hear enough about, and that is a group of people that is highly underrepresented, right? Mm-hmm. So let's dive in. Tell us a bit about your experience with the diversity and, and inclusion journey. Hmm. What does that look like for you? Because I know it looks different oh, for, for many many years. I just fit in. Society has taught us, especially American society has taught us, um, you can't be on the fence. You either got to be one or the other or on the side of this or on the side of that. Uh, We have been programmed to believe that that is the way to stand. And um, so my journey is a little different in that I was raised uh, as a girl, as a woman, as a young lady, um, but I never was one. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it would, it would, you know, fast forward to years later where I would find out my true identity, but I always knew it's not something that was new to me. It was just something that I didn't know how to introduce to the world, if that makes sense. So when you knew me in high school, I knew then, you know, in high school, I had come to a realization that I'm not a woman, mm-hmm. I'm not in the right body. I'm, I, there's something going on. My body don't even look like that of a woman. You know, I'm saying these things to myself outwardly but I was so closed and it, it it actually forced me to be uh what some would consider a late bloomer in life mm-hmm. relationships and things like that so although I had a fake boyfriend throughout high school mm-hmm. um we it wasn't an intimate thing and it was like no you know what I mean it was like absolutely not mm-hmm. and of course all these things became clear later in life that I recognized that all the things that I was thinking and feeling were absolutely true I just needed to find out later. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, you know, here it is. I'm, I'm in high school and I'm shaving a beard and a mustache and I'm shaving my legs and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm trying to fit into the F for my birth certificate just to find out that it was never supposed to be an F to begin with. Wow. Um, that was a, that was deep for me right there. The mm-hmm. F on your birth certificate. And I have to say, I've said this to you, you know, um, privately, of course, but um, meaning off air, but there was, the woman, the girl I knew in high school yeah. was not a happy girl. Yeah. The girl I knew in high school always seemed to be slightly uncomfortable. And the man I know today yeah. is an amazing father, yeah. an amazing life partner, 
yes. soon to be married, right? Yes. Uh, an, an amazing person and a happy person. Absolutely. And I have never met somebody more comfortable in their skin than you, mm -hmm. right? And to me, that particular gap, that is something that, that we don't talk about enough as a society, right? Mm -hmm. um, that, that need to be put into a particular box, right? I always say, um, with my son in particular, he has autism and yeah. I always consider him a square. I don't want my square to be a circle. I love my square. My square needs to be the best square. He needs to shine right. as a square, right? Because Absolutely. the square has value. The square has purpose, right? So does the circle, but yes. I'm not trying to make him something he's not. I'm trying to see him for who he authentically is. And that is why when I think about who you were, mm -hmm. Like, it's like somebody I never knew, yeah. but like the person that I see before me now, yeah. right, is is the person that's always been, if yeah. that makes sense. And I didn't even know that that's what you were going through. So when I see you now, I think this is my friend, Danny. He's yeah. annoying like most dudes, <laughs> right? Yeah. In the best way possible, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Because Darlene was somebody, honestly, that seemed so abstract she was awesome. She was so nice, but she was not happy. Yes. And Danny. It's so funny that you say that because uh, just yesterday, someone called me by Darlene. Of course, legally, my, my name has changed. My sex has changed and all that mm -hmm. stuff. Matter of fact, uh, we get into that during the intersex introduction, but uh, mm -hmm. everything's changed on paperwork. And um, this person was trying to come for me, you know, and the way they were coming for me was, okay, Darlene. As, wow. if, as if it was offensive, but yeah. Darlene is a part of who I am. Mm -hmm. uh, it, she never went anywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, she just transformed. It's almost like a butterfly, you know? Oh, and yes. butterfly had to, has to transform. Yes. So I am now a butterfly, but Darlene was the caterpillar. Mm -hmm. and, and I recognize that was all a part of my journey. And I don't reject Darlene. I never can and never will. I just recognized all along Darlene wasn't complete. Darlene right. was whole. Darlene wasn't it, you know, and because of that, you know, I had to continue on with my journey. And again, of course, it took years later for me to find out my true identity. Uh, and that comes with the unfortunate life journey of growing up in a foster care system where you're just a number. You're not a person. You're not a human in the form of let's find out what's going on with you. Mm -hmm. Why you don't have normal female things and why you don't, you know, they wasn't doing that. Nobody was looking at me. It's not like I went to a doctor and they were like, well, this is odd or whatever. And you're at this age. And, you know, when I went through puberty, I went through male puberty, mm -hmm. but I was in a group home when I went through puberty. Wow. So, so I was missed, you know, mm -hmm. and that's why, you know, I had to propel into adulthood to actually find out exactly who I was. Wow. But you know what, that, that to me, when I hear you say that about being in foster care, about being in a group home, that is, Honestly, what I like to refer to is diversity within diversity, an underrepresented group within an underrepresented group. Yeah. Right? And so the, the burden of not knowing, right, must yes. have been so, I can't even articulate it, it was, how hard it that must have been. like a balloon with water that has been blown into, and right about the point about the pop, that's exactly what my life felt like. Like, right. it was like something has to give yeah because yeah. none of this is making sense and it wasn't into the moment of the diagnosis it wasn't into the moment of speaking to an endocrinologist it wasn't to the moment of speaking to my doctor at the time my partner and saying oh my goodness you don't understand what this weight that just came up off my shoulders yeah. because everything I, I was feeling and huh. thinking and knowing was absolutely the truth i just needed help yeah. getting there and it was like Literally, it felt like the weight of the world had just lifted off my shoulders and that, that balloon popped. But and this time it popped on the good side, not on the bad side. Because sometimes that balloon could pop and it'd be very detrimental. But this mm -hmm. balloon popped and it was a balloon of love and tranquility and peace and, and happiness and uh, security. Empowerment. You know, and empowerment, right. And it, 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 it blossomed into my caterpillar, which is not necessarily normal if you are living in this bubble and you're like, you know, I can't tell you. How many times I, I contemplated suicide growing up mm -hmm. because, you know, my religion, my, my ethnic background, you know, taught me that uh, to be gay was going to be, um, you know, uh, detrimental to my 
my, my internal soul. And so, you know, all I did was try to delve into religion, delve into God, delve into, and say, just pray this way, you know, pray this demon away, pray this, whatever it was away, just to find out, oh, I'm a heterosexual man anyway. And I always was. Mm-hmm. You know, so had I off myself from all the times that I wanted to, or I was feeling the weight of the world on me, I would never come to the realization that now my job is to help save people like me. Yes. So feeling that feeling of pressure when honestly it's just about self-acceptance. Now we would like to take a moment to thank our sponsor. Westbridge Solutions is a professional training company focusing on diversity, inclusion, cultural competence, and soft skills trainings. Westbridge Solutions offers a variety of innovative training courses, both in-person and online, live and self-paced. Their clients include corporations, government organizations, healthcare organizations, the nonprofit sector, universities, and individuals such as yourself. Through their rigorous training programs, trainees learn to understand differences, leverage commonalities, and achieve organizational, professional, and personal actualization. To learn more about Westbridge Solutions, please feel free to visit their website at www.westgrouptraining.com or follow them on social media on Facebook and Instagram. Westbridge Solutions, empowering professionals for success. And I think one of the things I like to say is representation matters, right? So I, for one, am very grateful that Darlene was in the world because Darlene led to Danny and Danny led to transformational change for not only Danny, but so many other people. Because by seeing you, you living your authentic, true life, right? Yeah. You being the heterosexual male that you are, yes. right? A father, a yeah. provider, a caregiver, a protector, right? You being all of those things. This is something that some other young person needs to see, right? And that's why I love that you are, in your work, you are emboldening people to live their true lives, their authentic lives, right? So that's why I always think, you know, I commend you on it because I know for you, it wasn't easy. And as you said, you needed help. I think I think a lot of people, myself included, for whatever we are going through, especially through that tender age, you know, when you're a teenager and you think you know something, but you also know you don't know anything, right? We need adults in our lives, right? We need we need someone to reach out to us and say, you're going to be okay and explain things to us, whatever those things may be, right? Anything that causes us stress and turmoil and confusion, you know, to prevent us from, from harming ourselves, from okay. being harmed, right? So I, I think what you're doing right now is just coming full circle. Yes. Right? You're helping Darlene, who's still out there, right, become Danny. That's right. right. Just, I think it's magnified, though. It's magnified. So let's get into that term. What does intersex mean? Um, intersex is, a, is an umbrella term. Mm-hmm. And it basically means a human being or a person that does not fit the exact criteria of the variations of male, female. So, and I say umbrella because it is truly an umbrella in that you don't necessarily have uh, some intersex people now or intersex people are very, very different. It can be different in the spectrum. It's like a spectrum, just like the spectrum of, say, autistic children. Mm -hmm. Uh, Intersex people are on a spectrum as well. Mm -hmm. So on that spectrum, you could be a person that was born instead of XX or XY, you could be born XXY or XYX or whatever. So it's a variation of chromosomes. And Sometimes it's not a variation of chromosomes, but the outer and the inner of the body or the physical sense of who you are is very different. So, meaning you could have undescending testicles and not ovary, you know, and I don't mean, is it okay to be graphic? Yes, absolutely. This is, right, so. here's the thing. And I want everybody <laughs> to this show to know this. Like I, my career as an interpreter led me to using accurate terms, right? And so my mom used to always use accurate terms. So it's important for us to be accurate because then we have clarity and then we have understanding. So by all means, ovaries, testicles, go for it. So for example, uh, in in my variation, and I know many, many variations, there was a documentary done on me in 2008. Yes, I saw it the other day on television. Oh, yes. yes. I did. On Amazon Prime. Yes, absolutely. 
<laughs> called Intersection. And in that documentary, you know, I met so many of those people. So, uh, and although we are around the country uh, and around the world, literally, uh, I've met a lot of them and we've become friends on Facebook and stuff like that uh, because we all have the same story and journey, but very different variations. So when you talk about intersex, you talk about this big umbrella and there's so many different ones. So when it comes to my variation, I am that variation where I was X, I am XY chromosome, um, not XX chromosome, but I was raised as XX or female. Mm-hmm. And um, it was, like I said earlier, I was in the group home at during puberty time. And I remember I started growing hair on my face. And mm-hmm. so, you know, there could be heritism. It could be a lot of different things, uh, polycystic, whatever, whatever that is, is another term for it or whatever. Um, and at the time I had not been tested for anything. I just thought that I was just a hairy woman, you know? So I had hair all over my legs and all over my body. And I was just like, Oh my God, I'm growing a beard in high school. I mean, in junior high school, like what in the world's going on, mm-hmm. you know? And, um, so I, I, I shaved, it, and I actually transformed to fit the F on my birth certificate. Wow. You wouldn't, how do I present myself to the world when they're not going to understand what's going on with my physical body? So uh, I knew I was but You different. didn't even understand. I, I, I didn't understand, but I knew I was different. You right. know, So at that point, I just accepted it for just being different, which again goes back to my high school days when I decided to be just a late bloomer. Like nobody can deal with me because I don't can't deal with me because I don't know me right. and it's not like me or normal to me or whatever. So with that being said, I just went ahead and um, uh, shaved and t- to fit the F and it was coming. I was actually in, in a relationship with a young lady. And uh, I remember one day she said to me, I, I made an appointment for you with the GYN. Now at that point I had never been to a GYN and I'm in my early thirties at that point. Wow. And she says, um, I made a GYN appointment. I had never been to a GYN. And I said, why? Like, why am I going? You know, she was just like, I, I need you to see something. And she had taken a picture while I was asleep. And um, she said, this is you. And I'm looking at the picture and I'm like, you know, like, who is this dude? Like, literally. And she's like, that's you. And she was like, I really need you, you to go to the doctor. So mm-hmm. I, I agreed. And it was like two weeks later. So I, I agreed to go to the doctor with her. And that was a... GYN and I had never had women issues or problems. So I didn't understand why I had to go to a GYN. Right. <laughs> so, but that was pretty much a beginning of my revelation. So by me going to her who then turned in turn said, yes, yeah, something's very different about you. And then we're going to go send you to an endocrinologist and we're going to go do this and do that, do that. And then went on to a road of doctors and a lot of research and a lot of testing. But mm-hmm. at the end of the road, I was like, Oh, I get it. You know what I mean? So it all made sense in the long run. So I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for the meeting and the relationship with this young lady because she, you know, we're still really good friends to this day uh, because she helped me find me. And um, although I knew something was different, I just didn't have a term for it. I didn't know what it meant or mm-hmm. what it was. So when I first heard the term intersex, so again, I was in my early 30s and I'm a, I was a police officer and I was a liaison for the police department here. So they ran it on the front page and they ran it in the major newspaper down here. And I remember going into stores and people were like, you're that officer that was on the front page of the paper. And I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. And they're like, oh man, I want to know more. And it put me on this whole path of being able to enlighten other folks that literally there's a third sex. And sometimes things are not what they appear. And my mom used to always say, don't judge a book by its cover. And she, that was one of her favorite phrases. And of course we hear it very often today, but that was my mother's very, one of her very, very favorite phrases. And I understand that now. So like when I go through the airport, I get stopped every time. You know what I mean? It's like, it's, it's every single time I go to the Are you airport. Serious? So it's like an uncomfortable thing for me that I have learned to how to embrace because you're, I'm a make, I'm a makeup of male, female, and I'm a makeup of, you know, my beard and mustache says one thing, but then I have certain body parts that say something else. And so they like, this woman literally said, uh, TSA worker said earlier last or well, late last year, she said, I'm confused. She's looking at the cameras and she's like, I'm confused. And she literally said it out of her mouth. And I'm just like, mm-hmm. and I smiled at her because again, she doesn't know. Right, she, right. She, it's, there's no male intent. Said, but, all hey, right. I was born in a sex. You ain't going to understand. Not right now. Right. I need to test this flight. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Could you do me a favor and look it up? You know? Right. <laughs> you know? Google so, it. <laughs> yeah, Google it, right. So at the end of the day, I get, I get that a lot. And um, 
again, it's it's coming to a place of being able to accept it and not having to change because of it. Because it's so easy for me to go get on hormone mm-hmm. and look one way completely. Mm-hmm. But I love the fact that I embrace me. Yes. God, to me, made me this way. I've never had a surgery. I'm 100% natural and I love it. And I'm going to stay this way. And because I'm going to stay this way, that means that there will always be questions and there will always be people who say, I don't get it. Well, I don't understand. And that's my job. That's one of the purposes of why I'm here. So I have to embrace it and say, okay, well, let me explain. Well, let me help you. Because all those people coming behind me that's intersex and don't know how to have a voice or don't have a voice and don't know how to explain, mm-hmm. I've then made the way and opened the door for them. Yes. And that's what my job is. I love it. I love that, that you are paving the way for them. And, and again, I say, this is why I'm grateful to Darlene because mm-hmm. Darlene created Danny and Danny is helping change the way society thinks about gender, yeah. right? Because that third gender has to be acknowledged, yeah. right? And I, I do think, well, we'll get into what I think about, you yeah. know, children in a second, but because you're the subject matter expert up in here. <laughs> so um, I want to know what's the difference then between being transgender, transsexual and having an intersex condition? Uh, tran- transgender and transsexual to me are interchangeable, actually. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But it's when you're emotionally and psychologically feel like you're not in the right body. Mm-hmm. So you can be born female, born male, but you feel like you identify and you think like very much like the opposite sex. Mm -hmm. So that's transgender and transsexual. And the physical things that you can do being transsexual and transgender is to uh, take hormones, Mm -hmm. do surgeries or whatever, and then change your physical body to fit that of the gender in which you identify with, Uh, which is awesome that you have the ability to do that. Intersex people can actually be transgender as well Mm -hmm. uh, because it is just another sex. Uh, however, it really depends on the intersex person itself. You know what I mean? What their genetic makeup is, what their uh, chromosome outcome look like and whatever. So two out of a hundred people they're saying, and it is really guessing because they really don't know how many intersex people are in America, in America. I'm just talking about America. I'm not even talking about the world. They have no idea how many intersex people are because you could actually literally go through your whole life and not know you're intersex. True, true. That. So because of that, they don't know. So they guessing, guesstimating about two out of every 100 people are born intersex. And those that are intersex, um, well, well, you know, this is the really funny thing. Because um, when I was born, my mother was really, really sick with me. And uh, I was her third birth. Well, I was her third pregnancy, second birth. Okay. And when she was pregnant with me, I put her body through a lot. Now everything makes sense. My mother passed when I was 17, so we never really had a, a chance to have this conversation. But I knew that I put her through a lot, and I knew I was born premature, and I knew all the things that she told me about my birth, but I do know one story she told me, which was your first name was Raymond Lee Harris Jr. Wow. She had never had a sonogram. She had an amniocentesis. That is a foolproof test as to what the sex of the baby is. Mm-hmm. So when I came out, she said, they were like, oh, we made a mistake. But no, it really wasn't a mistake. So whatever reason, again, I never had this conversation with my mom. I'm just grateful. I wasn't, they didn't perform surgery on me. They didn't try to fit me in a box. They, for whatever reason, because I don't have the answer to that because my mom is not here for, to answer that question, but she never let them touch me. Mm-hmm. And for whatever reason that was, she just let them be and just said, okay, well, then it's just going to be Darlene. Because at the time, she didn't even have a name. She said, you look a little doll. And I just named you Darlene. You know? <laughs> I love it. Because I always ask, where did Darlene come from? You know, um, And she just let it be what it was naturally. And again, my mother would say certain things to me, which made me know she knew something more. Mm-hmm. But again, I grew up in the foster care system, so I was with mom, then not with mom. You know what I mean? And then when I came back with mom, I had less than two years before she passed on. So it was very difficult for me to get the information that I needed to fulfill my my seeking mm-hmm. or, or to fulfill my um, my my self-obligation of finding out the truth. So it, it, I had to do that journey by myself. And, and it was very different uh, and difficult. But I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that, because again, she knew I was male at birth, before birth. And then they named me a female name and just said, okay, raise, raise them. But most intersex people don't go through that. If they're known, uh, meaning ambiguous genitalia, they will cut you and they will hack you and they will mutilate you. You know what I mean? In order to fit 
a box that the parents want or that the doctor wants. And I think that is one of the biggest disservice in our medical community that can ever be done to a child. Instead of allowing a child to just grow, mm-hmm. and grow up and come into who they are. Yes. And then any surgeries that may need to be performed, they have that option. And if none need to be performed, they still have that option. But for, for, for us to rob our children of the ability to have a fulfilled and whole life, because we cut and we snip and we, we, we medicate, mm-hmm. you know, conditions that are not conditions because intersex is not a condition. It's actually a normal variance of humanness. Mm-hmm. It's not even a condition. It's not considered uh, abnormality. We're part of the hermaphrodite family. Mm-hmm. Um, but not everybody's a true ma- hermaphrodite either. So it's just uh, so many different levels to it. Oh my gosh, you're blowing me away with all <laughs> of that. You're blowing me away. And I'm glad you, you corrected me and said that it's not a condition because that lends to my education yeah. and the education of our listeners. And like I told you yeah. off air, um, this is why I have this podcast really to learn more You know, for myself, it's a selfish endeavor, but I'm hoping to share it with other people. So I thank you for that. I thank you for that. And it's good to know that distinction because I feel that sometimes people intermingle those terms, transgender and intersex, because they're not the same thing. Because Well, transgender and transsexual will physically change their bodies. Right. But intersex Intersex is born to me. Okay. Oh, okay. So the difference when you're transgender and you say, I'm transgender male, I'm transgender female, that means that you have physically done something to fit the other box. Whereas I'm intersex, non uh, uh, surgical Mm -hmm. intersex, Mm -hmm. meaning I've never had a surgery and I'm just normal. I'm 100% natural. So I'm not on hormones, never been on hormones, which is what the most mind blowing thing of people is because most intersex people sit on a cusp. Uh, feminine and masculine qualities. Most intersex, if you ever watched the, the documentary like you have, uh, the intersection, you'll see that a lot of intersex people, especially intersex, quote unquote, females, will sit on a cusp of masculinity and femininity. You just kind of don't know. <laughs> Depending on what they do with their physical appearance, right? you will be confused. Yes. And, and, and that's the thing about intersex people. So, so we have the ability to kind of ride that fence. Uh, I could be feminine, feminine if you want me to, and I could be very masculine if you want me to as well. So we fly that fence, but if you appearing to us, you know, but you see me and a lot of people actually still misgender me. Wow. So say. that brings me to another question. Yes. So I don't like to say at this point, what is your preferred pronoun? Yes. Because I think preference indicates that there is a choice. So I rather say, what is your pronoun? So um, her, he, sir. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. M is my pronoun. Because I remember when you met my son and um, one of our mutual friends, shout out to Kimberly, she came to visit. Um, so she better be listening to this episode. <laughs> so, you know, we're going to get her on to listen. But um, when you and Kimberly came over to visit my home, you'd met my son for the first time, right? Yeah. And I asked you, how do children, well, what do you want Alex to call you? Right. Um, Because I wanted to respect you. Right. But I also wanted Alex to, you know, respect his elders and, you know, appropriately, you know, address, you know, anyone that's in our home, any friend of mine, any person I care about. So you said to me, and this was really liberating. You said, oh, I let the kids see what they see and say what they say. And I was like, really? Okay. And what was interesting to me was that Alex refer to you in a male way, yes. right? I forget the words that he used, but I was like, okay, then this is Uncle Danny, right? Yeah. And that was the end of that. And, you know, it was so simple. Yeah. And I think sometimes we have lessons that we can learn from children. Absolutely. I was just like, all okay. Time. All the time. Right, all the time. Because the time. they, they keep it so simple, whereas yeah. I think we as adults tend to make it more complex and more complicated. Yeah. Here I was thinking, okay, I want to honor my friend. Yes. I want my son to be respectful. What yes. do I do? And and you know me, I will just ask. Um, yeah. I'm not one to tiptoe around to me. I'm like, what do you want him to call you, <laughs> right? And then I know we can just continue on with life. But I love that you gave him the, honestly, the freedom yes. and, and the respect, right, yeah. that we do owe children too, to use his own judgment, 
right? And and then I felt like, wow, that was an authentic relationship, yeah. you know. And I loved just seeing that interaction, and yeah. I thought it was I thought it was really beautiful and fantastic, you. you know. And I was like, let me have a seat because yeah. here I am <laughs> trying to make it harder than it is. Mm-hmm. So let me ask you, for you, Danny, your your pronoun is he, right? He, him, his, but. For somebody else, as we said, there are many intersex people that are on the cusp, right? Yeah. So yeah. then would we use they, would we use she? And I guess that would vary with the person individually, yeah? Absolutely. And I think that the be- the most the most important thing to do with intersex as well as transgender people is ask. Just ask the question. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and and it's it's believe it or not, a lot of uh intersex and transgender people just would prefer you ask than to yes. to just guess. Right. So if you know you say if you're not sure, then there's nothing wrong with asking the question. I'm not. I'm not saying that everybody's not going to get offended. Right. You have those individuals who's still not comfortable with themselves. Mm-hmm. They may very well be a touchy subject for them. Mm-hmm. But all you can do is what you can do. And right. to me, my suggestion is to ask. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what to, you know, what, who would you like for me to refer you as? Right. And um, you give that to them. And sometimes, most times, 90% of the time, 99% of the times, you're going to have them come back and say, oh, I'm glad you asked. You know, maybe, right. it's, you know, it's he, it's she, it's whatever. So um, just asking the question is okay. You know, and then it, and if they don't want to give you, then you use the phase and the <laughs> right, right. The other ones, you use the general term so that you don't offend anybody. Right. But again, uh, you have to understand. I think that the most important thing to understand is that although uh, some people are acknowledging that they're intersex or transgender or anything like that, um, they're not necessarily comfortable with it either. Mm-hmm. There are some people that's very different in their walk with themselves. Right. So you're going to have people in different stages with themselves. So I am at the stage where I accept Darlene and Danny wholly mm-hmm. completely. And no matter what the world sees, I know what I am and I know who I am. Mm-hmm. And I'm, on, I'm okay with that. And I'm happy and grateful that my children and my, my partner and my fiance is all okay with that. So I'm okay being okay with me. But right. there's not everybody's there. Yes. That's, so, yeah, people with the journey. Yeah. Yeah. And that took time. Yeah. And I think yeah. Too, what I see in you now is a lack of fear because of an empowerment that you gain through understanding. Yes. Right. So and I think in my experience, when I have asked people, how would you like me to refer to you? Right. Because I also had to mm-hmm. ask myself, how do I ask that question respectfully? Right. Mm-hmm. Because there's a way to ask people stuff. Right. And I said to myself, OK, I feel like this would be a respectful way to ask. And then when I do, I've never come across anyone that's ever been angry at the question, mm-hmm. you know, and, and it made for a better and more authentic relationship. You know, because because I want to be respectful, but I also like I'm going to refer just like you're going to refer to me as she, her, hers. Right. I need to have a pronoun. And so um, what one thing that I do think, though, with people that that will take offense at it is that there is a fear of rejection associated with that. Right. A fear of judgment for honestly. I, I just, it saddens me that somebody would have to go through that fearing that we would judge them for just being themselves, right? But I think when you get to know yourself, then maybe that fear dissipates a bit. I'm not sure. You no, know, I, I know for me I, that, I that... That is really hard to gauge because of the person's experience. Yeah, yeah. You so, just, you like, know. growing up, I would be considered a lesbian, right? Because mm-hmm. all I dated was women. Mm-hmm. So I wouldn't have been considered a lesbian because all my birth certificate said F. Mm-hmm. All along, I'm male, chromosome-wise, mm-hmm. ambiguous genitalia, and I didn't understand who I was. Mm-hmm. So I had to be accepted by the lesbian community for, for many years. Mm-hmm. And then I didn't feel like I fit in in that community. Right. You know? And so then here I am navigating and finding out who I really am and then coming at this, oh, it makes so sense, so much sense. Okay, so I'm a heterosexual man, you know, I'm just trapped in this, you know, ambiguous body and okay, 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 I'm good now. So now I'm whatever. But then do the heterosexuals really absolutely uh, accept you? No. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So now I'm living in a world where I'm not necessarily accepted by any group. It is just me. Mm-hmm. I am left standing 
in self and the I am of who I am and just understanding that I have to accept myself and understand myself and educate other people and whoever accepts me, I'm okay. But if they don't, it's okay as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's coming into a place where you're absolutely the floating sex because you don't fit in anywhere. But I will say this, knowing you how I know you, right? And seeing you evolve into this wonderful, beautiful, amazing man, right? Mm -hmm. With this spirit, just I wish that our listeners could see you because they would understand. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, but I know that your message that you're conveying will get them to see and understand this. But but I I see what you mean about floating, right? Not fitting into a particular place. But what I happen to notice with you is that people are drawn to you. So even though you don't think you fit into a particular place, people are drawn to you. Right. And so for that, it could be a lonely place to not fit in. But lonely is the last place I see you as or in. Because you're always surrounded by family, friends, just all the time. And and I think that's because you've been true to yourself. Exactly. You know, you said the words I have had to learn to be true to myself. But because we in this human experience, having this temporary time in this body. Um, we always want to be accepted by any group, sure. whatever group that looks like, whether it's the black group, whether it's the minority group, whether it's the a majority group, whatever it is, whatever it is that we want. It's a part of, and Freud, Freud Sigmund Freud uh, said it best, you know, just really understanding who we really are. We, there is a formulation of what our idea of who acceptance is and who we are sure. as a person. So we always have that issue. And I think it took me longer because I didn't fit into any of the groups that I was around. So I had to kind of allow my group to exist without, you know, independently of what I have been accustomed to. Mm -hmm. But yet you're right. I think that the self-confidence has drawn people to me. But believe it or not, Bertine, it's still very uncomfortable um, for me to always feel like I always have to be on cue. Right. No, because you just kind of want to live. Yeah. You know, um, and I don't always want to be asked the questions mm-hmm. at all times. Yeah. Or whatever. But I recognize that I'm, I'm authentically me. And so because I'm not on hormones, because if I got on, say, testosterone and completely harden everything up and whatever, whatever, then no one would ask any questions. Right. But then you wouldn't be who you are. No, you're right. And, and also, I wouldn't be educating those that needed to know. Right. So that, that, that's a double edged sword, though, because I, I just kind of want to just be me right. and live and, 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 and enjoy my family, enjoy my outings or whatever without people looking three and four times at me because that's, right. I get that all the time. And then my fiance is like, I just don't see what people see. All I see is male. They <laughs> see me. And I'm like, are you looking at the same thing I'm looking at? Because that is nothing male or female about that person. I don't understand why. You know, so we go through that all the time. And she's like, I just don't get it. I just don't get it. Like, what are they looking at? And I'm like, that's that's the part of being intersex. Right. It's just a part of my, my, my journey, you know? And it, it, it sometimes it's, it, it becomes tiring. It right. Because you just want to be a dude from Atlanta. Like, right. and I, I liken that to, honestly, um, I was, and it's so weird that you said this because I was having this conversation, a conversation of a similar vein with a colleague the other day. And I think, especially in in light of what's been going on um, with um, just the racial tensions here in the United States, the political divisions, and I happen to love political science. I'm a political science adjunct professor. I I love political discourse and debate. You know, I love diversity, inclusion, and equity conversations, but there are days where I just want to be a girl from Queens. Yep. And I don't want to, I don't want to have to think about the burden of educating somebody about something. Right. I'm just like, can I just go to Costco? Like, can I just do that? You know, (laughs) because there are days where I'm like, even here right. at Costco, come on hey, now. I'm a Costco girl, I'm a Sam dude, okay? You and my husband are too much alike. He is a Sam <laughs> dude. We have, we butt heads over that, you know, I'm Costco for life, but. <laughs> Sam, Sam, Sam. <laughs> but it, it is a burden to have to constantly be in that mindset. And it is a fatigue, I will say, you know, so I can only imagine what it is for you. 
you know, Absolutely. to constantly have to educate. And then for me, like there are days where I'm like, I'm going to quit this line of work. I'm going to quit it. I'm going to quit it. And five seconds later, I'm like, I can't, yes. you know, but you can't quit being who you are. Right. Exactly. So that's where there's a huge difference between, you know, what I do for my living and who you are as a person and what you represent. Right. right? So that burden is, I would say, tenfold easily. Right. Yeah. If not more than that. So I, I get it, though, insofar as sometimes you just want to be and that's it. That's right. It. And you deserve I'm that. Any, I'm hanging out. I'm just chilling. Um, that's it. I don't I'm taking care of the baby. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> that's 50% of my life right there. You know what I mean? Leo, you know? A potty <laughs> training Leo. Potty training it. joy. <laughs> oh, man. And she's special needs. And, mm-hmm. you know, thank God for her because she has helped me to absolutely embrace myself more. Right. Even with her. She's in charge of you. We know this. Oh, yeah. We know this. <laughs> you may be all of these things, Dr. Danny Lee Harris, president of truth, but at home, you're just daddy and it's potty training season. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I feel bad for you for that because <laughs> we're done with that. <laughs> but now let me ask you on a, on a serious, um, a more serious tone. Uh, what are we, when we're talking about intersex people, we usually talk about adults right? We don't talk about children. And, and especially because you experienced puberty while you were in a foster home, a group home where you weren't even being, you weren't in a position where you were the focus of the attention, right? And so when you, for, for kids, especially kids who are in that particular type of situation, what can we do as a society to make the world a safer place for intersex children? Because I, I agree with you. I think, I I think, think that's, that's definitely a very good question. I'm, I appreciate you asking that question. I think the first thing is to stop stop trying to fit intersex kids into a box. Right. I and agree that they should the not be. Box is the physical mutilation of our intersex uh-huh. kids, whether they're male or female, uh, XY or XX chromosome, leave them alone. Yeah. Let them grow into who they're going to become because you have so many different layers to that. Not only is it just the physical, but it's also the, you know, you have gender identity mm-hmm. and orientation, you know, so you have so many different layers to that. Just leave them. Yeah. Just leave them. I have a, a, a friend of mine who um, I grew up with and he was born intersex. And well, he was born intersex in that he was trans. I mean, he was um, a hermaphrodite, true mm-hmm. hermaphrodite. And you don't see too many true hermaphrodites oh, anymore. Rare. He was true hermaphrodite, and they cut his 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 genitalia off, his male genitalia off, uh, to fit this box. But he grew up a man, right? Without his genitalia. So to to to, and I met him when I was nineteen. I was like eighteen, nineteen years old. And you want to talk about angry? Mm-hmm. He was he was he was from the Indian descent. His family had migrated from uh, to America from India, and he was first generation uh, American. And he was angry. He was a very angry guy because they took his manhood from him without his permission. Because had they let him grow up, and uh, he was very extremely hairy. There was nothing feminine about him whatsoever. So you look at him, you say guy. You look at him, you say male. You look at him, you say X, Y. No doubts about that. Mm-hmm. But he was missing his genitalia. And, and at the time that I met him at 19, uh, he hadn't spoken to his parents in five years. Yeah. Because when he learned who he was, you know, and what happened in, in surgery at birth, it destroyed him. Mm-hmm. And so I, I, I lost contact with him. So I, I never know what happened to him, but I often think about him because... That is the problem with intervention at birth. Yeah. You, how can you intervene in something you don't know nothing about? I you have them be. And for whatever reason, I am grateful. Mm-hmm. I, when I tell you, I am grateful. My mother said no. Because I promise you, they would have said, they had to say something to her because I know I was born with amb- ambiguous genitalia and they had to say something to her about correction. Mm-hmm. And for whatever reason, she said no. And I'm grateful because I'm the one, one of the few who have escaped the mutilation of genitalia. And I'm the one who, the, who has escaped uh, them trying to figure out or make me who they want me to be. Mm. I have to say this. I think your mother was brave 
I really do because based on other, you know, documentaries that I've seen and, and, you know, people that I've spoken to and not even at length, but just the tip of the iceberg type of conversation during the time, the era that you and I were born and prior to that, right? The doctors always deferred to making the children female. And that to me, you, you not only rob who that child would have become, but you've killed who they would have become, right? And that years later manifests itself in aggression, depression, and suicide, right? And it, it seems to me, I think if we, because I, I do try to be empathetic to both sides. And I think fear is the reason why people do that, fear of the unknown. But how do we combat that? Education, understanding, knowledge, right? And I think people feared their children being harmed, harassed, whatever they thought was going to happen. But the greater beast was that their children may not be on earth, right? Because, you know, if you, I can only imagine the the plight of the the young man that you mentioned, um, because that person, they're left with a part of their, not only their physical body, but their soul, their identity has been taken from them and they never had a choice in it. And I think the parents would have done that out of fear and ignorance and ignorance in the, you know, not in the malevolent um, sense of the word, but the fearful sense of the word, right? Just pure lack of knowledge. And so I wonder, and that's why I think about children now. I, what I've seen now, children are given a chance because I feel like that's what that is. They're given the chance to become and evolve into their true selves. Right. And then if there's a decision to be made, they're the ones to make it. Right. We're, we're, we're almost there. We're not there. Not completely there. In this community, we still see it happening every day. Mm-hmm. Uh, like I said, two out of a hundred people. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of people. Two percent of our population. You, you're a brand new parent or you're not a brand new parent, but you're just a parent, a brand new parent, meaning in that moment. Right. And they say to you, well, there's something going on here physically with this child, you know, let's go ahead and make it, you know, what it appears to be to me is, you know, as a medical professional, you're going to trust that doctor. You're going to say, okay, well, maybe I should, you know what I mean? And mm-hmm. putting this kid on something that they can never get off of. You right. start a child, a newborn off on hormones, they can't get off of that. You know what I mean? Instead of just allowing them to just grow up. Like for me, if they would have put me on estrogen, it would completely destroy. I don't even think, honestly, at 47 years old, I'll be alive today. Right. You know? Right. So, so there's so many different layers to what you're doing to the person. Mm-hmm. That instead of just letting them just be, you know? Because, like, right now, even at my age, I'm, I, well, uh, finding out I was innocent, I found out that I could never take testosterone. Really? So even if I wanted to switch over and completely become so hardened that there's no question, mm-hmm. I couldn't do it. Because my body absolutely produces so much testosterone that to put more synthetic testosterone into my body would only kill me. Oh my God. It would only be detrimental to me, my health long term. So it, it just doesn't make sense to do it. Right. So I, am, I thank God for it because I'm in a place where I cannot physically do anything but stay natural. Right. And that helps me help other people to live their truth. Again, we're back to representation. We're back yeah. to representation. <laughs> and then let me ask you this. So how has um, your work within the diversity and inclusion space affected your interactions um, with other people uh, professionally and personally? And it's been wonderful. It's been wonderful in the, fa- in the sense of being able to enlighten people. And I have absolutely had an enjoyable time since 2008 till now. So what, 12 years? Educating people and, and teaching people what it is to be intersex, what it is, what it looks like, you know, what's that third sex really like? And, you know, uh, helping people to understand. But, but believe it or not, what people don't recognize and understand is that intersex people are so much needed in this world because intersex people is actually the bridge to helping to understand transgenderism and transsexualism. So when I go to churches and I speak in churches, and tell people that I was born this way. What does that do automatically for people who want to automatically judge somebody who they think chose mm. to be transgender or transsexual? You know what I mean? So it opens up the mind a little bit more to be able to. So I always say I'm the bridge for transgender folks. So although I'm not transgender, I understand their plight. Mm. I understand their struggle. And I understand their story. However, and like I tell them, I am your bridge. Because there's nothing that uh, a person of religion or faith or or, or 
even if science can say to me that, you know what I mean, I can't rebuttal. For example, I was born this way. And if it's the, the religious aspect, well, God doesn't make mistakes. You're absolutely right. God didn't make a mistake with you. You know what I mean? So, so, so I'm able to build the bridge that is unique and, and, and only intersex people can do. Wow. I love it. I love it. No other group of people that can do what I do. And I think that's a wonderful way to view it, building a bridge, right? Um, because this way, honestly, this would appeal to now, especially that we're we're so divided into conservative versus liberal. Yeah. Well, quite honestly, I think most of us are moderate. But, <laughs> you know, right. this right. is the way that with that particular premise, people can't refute that, right? Yeah. Because what is the conservative going to say? You weren't born this way, but you were. What is a liberal going to say? Well, I can choose what I want, but this wasn't a choice. This is just who you are and how you were naturally made, right? So I, I love how that can cross into Absolutely. both sides of the political spectrum as well. Yeah. I really think that's amazing. Yeah. And so then we're going to wrap up now because now you know this is going to be a two-parter <laughs> because I can talk to Danny for hours <laughs> about a million things. But I want you to tell our audience what are two things that you'd like to impart, impart upon them? Like if you're going to leave them with any thoughts about what we've discussed today that you really want them to think on, what would those two things be? And I hope that this interview helped you to understand the true importance of never judging a book by its cover. Mm -hmm. That's number one. The second thing is embracing yourself in such a way that you don't ask for respect, but you demand it. So whatever that difference is, whatever that you want to be included in, understand that people only include you because you demand it, not because you ask. Wow. So when you live in your authentic self, when you live in your authentic truth, you're absolutely sending off this signal of, I'm not asking you, I'm demanding this. So I have never had the issue of disrespect in my life since I came out as intersex. Instead, it's been the opposite. Most people, I don't understand, but I respect it. And it's not something I say, it's something that I live. Mm -hmm. So living in your truth is the absolute, absolute de definition of you must accept my truth. And I'm demanding respect. And that's it. Wow. Thank you, my friend, Dr. Danny Lee Harris for this amazing conversation. Amazing Absolutely. conversation. Absolutely. And I knew it was going to be. I was just, but you know what? We need an eight-hour podcast and we can't do that. <laughs> but thank you for sharing with me, with the audience. Absolutely. It, it is my honor and pleasure to have you on this show. And I am looking forward to your presentation at the 2020 Global Fluency Podcast. Uh, I can't, I can't wait. Podcast, at the 2020 Global Fluency Summit in yeah. October. So I know that what you are going to bring to our attendees is going to be spectacular and highly informative. So thank you for sharing your truth, your journey, your message, your story, because I appreciate you having me. And I thank you all of your listeners for listening. I appreciate it. Thank you. And for all of our listeners out there, remember, this is your podcast. So I want to hear from you. Reach out to us on our social media. Follow us on the Global Fluency Podcast on Facebook. And let us know your thoughts about today's conversation. And as always, we want you to continue those conversations after this interview. So make sure that, you know, you're at that virtual water cooler. You're on the phone. You're talking about some of the gems that Dr. Danny has dropped on us today. So once again, I'm Bertine Prevacore West, and it has been my pleasure to be your host for today's episode of the Global Fluency Podcast. Remember, let's keep the conversation going. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Global Fluency Podcast. Tune in every second and fourth Tuesday of the month at 10 a.m. for our latest episode. Connect with us on our social media. You can find us on Facebook at Global Fluency Podcast and on Instagram at Westbridge Solutions, LLC. Global Fluency Podcast. Understanding differences, leveraging commonalities. Let's keep the conversation going, going, going.